Hello and welcome to another episode of Marriage on a Tightrope. I'm Alan. And I'm Katie. And we are still married. We wanted to thank everyone for coming to the Davis County Meetup. We had about 40 people there. And yeah. thank you to the Barneys who hosted us. It was a great event. We are going to get to our episode with Jana Reese, but we had a few announcements and a f- before we get there. Yeah, a few of them are, are meetup-based. So the next meetup that we have is going to be on November 2nd. That is in St. George. Uh, the full event and the sign-up to, to bring some food and or drinks is there in the Facebook group as well. So go check that out. We're excited to see everybody there. Let's see if we can beat the now that Davis County holds the most people at the event uh, with a little over 40. It was like 42. Right. And if you're single and you want to come to this event, hey, please come. You don't need to come with your spouse. You don't need to have a spouse to come. Uh, everyone is welcome. And if you have friends in the area you want to invite to come with you also, they are welcome. We have three new meetups. One of them we didn't have a date for or an event for, but now we do. So why don't you right. Why don't you talk about January 11th? Yeah, so January 11th, we will be in Mesa, Arizona. I booked our plane tickets this morning, so we are set to go. It'll be Saturday, January 11th at 5 p.m. We do have a venue site. We just are working out the details. So if you go, again, to the events page within our Facebook group, you'll be able to see that and sign up and get the information for that. And then we have two more that we just we just booked today also. If you pay attention to the podcast, you know that... Uh, One of these, or both of these meetups were probably the next to come. So we're excited to announce that on February 12th, we will be having a meetup in Austin, Texas. And on the next day, February 13th, we will have a meetup in Dallas, Texas. It kind of coincides with a work trip I have. I have to be in Dallas the 14th through the 18th. So we thought, hey, we'll just go a couple days earlier. So sorry, it's not on a weekend. I know that that's ideal for most people, but that's kind of how it how it fell. Is uh, we had to work around my my schedule. So we're excited. I I really haven't ever been to Texas. I haven't been in a long time. Like so. I f- I've flown through Texas, but I haven't like been to Texas. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, we're excited to to get out there, meet people like the Harwards we know are out there. So it's going to be it's going to be a blast. Yes, Austin and Dallas, February 12th and 13th. Again, Facebook for the events. And you can sign up. If you don't want to go to Facebook and you're not on Facebook, just shoot us a message uh, through our email and we'll send you the event information too. Yep. The whole reason why we spend so much time talking about these meetups is we want to connect people with each other. So these meetups are a really good opportunity to do do that. And it's really the, the full, the next phase of this podcast is just connecting people. A lot of times we're the, we're the, the, commonality the common yeah the common we're the common link and once people meet each other then we step out and now you've got friends that live just a couple of miles away it seemed like 70 percent of the people at the davis county meetup were from syracuse which was really fun to run fun to right see. they all lived like right around the house that was hosting the event so that was that was cool to see so i also am trying to put together a retreat a women's retreat and I, I put a question out there on both Instagram on, and Facebook, trying to get some feedback as to what month would work best, if it's you wanted an overnight, what you would like to hear at a retreat. So that's in the works. Hopefully we can get that pulled together, have some professionals there to do some workshops, which would be really great. Uh, so that's in the works as well. And we also are very excited that we are closing in on 1,000 members of our Facebook group, which is crazy. So it's grown quite quickly. What we want to do is, in the spirit of celebrating that 1,000 members and in the holidays coming up, we want to have a little gift book giveaway. So if you uh, go to the Facebook group, if you haven't already joined it, go ahead and join it and look for a post. We'll post Pretty, pretty soon when we had a thousand members celebrating it. And then we have a few books that we want to give away. David Osler's book, um, Jana Reese's book, which we're going to talk about here with Jana in a minute. Uh, Katie's reading a new book called Fierce Conversations, which she's really enjoying. So I think we'll give a copy of that away. Um, we just want to spread the love to, to all of you who are involved in the community. So uh, thank you for joining. And 
Uh, the last thing, as you can can tell, we're investing a lot of time and effort and money into going around and meeting up with people, going to dinner with couples, giving away books and and making recommendations, etc. So if you would like to support the podcast, you can do so through our website, marriageonatightrope.org, and there's a donate button. You can use PayPal there, or you can use Venmo and Venmo us at Marriage on a Tightrope. Can I say something about Med Venmo? Sure. So we put last week like our marriage on a tightrope venmo account and and it was cool because one of our listeners just said hey everyone just send them 10 bucks and so we had quite a few donations come in through venmo i think it's easier i think people use venmo a lot more than they use paypal right well it's just more common it is it's more common so hey any we will take any amount of donation that you want to send or contribute to our Marriage on a Tightrope group. It all goes back into this podcast. We do this podcast because we really love doing it. We love recording. And up until this point, we've been doing it for free. And we will continue to do it for free. So all of the donations go right back into it. Thank you very much for your ongoing support. And now we hope you enjoy our interview with Jana Reese. We are now joined very excitedly on our side, hopefully on her side as well, by Jana Reese. Jana, welcome to Marriage on a Tightrope. Thank you so much. We're so excited to have her on. Uh, Katie is going to introduce her real quick, and then we'll get into it. Yeah, so Jana, Jana Reese is a senior columnist um, for Religion News Service and the author or co-author of many books, including Mormonism and American Politics, Flunking Sainthood, and The Prayer Wheel, Rediscovering Prayer with an Ancient Spiritual Practice. She has a PhD in American Religious History from Columbia University and is the author of The Next Mormons, How Millennials Are Changing the LDS Church. And that's what we are going to talk about today. Uh, Jana, I love you on Facebook. I love your, I love your book. I think that it's absolutely fascinating, and I just, I can't wait to get into it. Great. Uh, I will say, on on my side of belief, having someone that is still involved heavily and still has um, very strong beliefs in the church, but is vocal about how they feel and building bridges is... I still think it's a very rare thing. And so it's your voice is so appreciated on the full agnostic doesn't believe anything anymore side uh, that just wants to have a healthy relationship with those that are in. So folks like you, David Osler, Richard Osler, those, those, it's just so appreciated. Um, So thank you. Uh, She, we told her we were going to pump her up a little bit and she, uh, before we started (laughs) recording, she said, no, just keep that to a minimum. And um, I I know that those that are listening understand why we're so excited about having her on the podcast. So we would like to, to start the interview by, by talking about the book, The Next Mormons, what spawned the idea, uh, the research that went into it, uh, because it's quite extensive. And I think we'll start from there. You know, this actually started out as a very different book. It was going to be about Mormon childhood. And so that was back in 2011, 2012. And then as I started doing the interviews for that book, talking to people about their childhood, I became very interested in what was happening to people as adults. And also just looking around uh, anecdotally to see some of the changes that were happening that I could observe among millennials like you all, um, I wanted to find out how common is that? And also, is it true that more people in their 20s and 30s are leaving the the church now than people in their 20s and 30s have done in the past? I mean, we have long known that that's kind of a critical time for people to leave religion or switch religion. So I wanted to know, is it more now than it used to be? And it is. And this book is just full of only your opinions, no scientific studies, no <laughs> no research whatsoever, right? Talk, talk to us a little talk bit about the research. Yeah, the, the background and the research that went into it. Okay, sure. Well, I'm trained as a historian, and my doctorate is in American religious history, which isn't much help when it comes to designing a national social science <laughs> study. 
Right. Um, so I enlisted the help of a number of people, including Benjamin Knoll, whose name is not on the book, but uh, has been involved with every part of this process. Ben is a political scientist and has conducted national research before. Um, I also had help from Gordon and Gary Shepard, who are soci sociologists, Ryan Cragen, Armand Moss. Um, you know, it was very, very good to have this be a project where many people were involved in designing the questions, helping me understand how to structure a survey, which is an interesting art that I didn't realize. And then uh, I needed to get the funding to do this because to do a national study as opposed to, you know, a nationally representative study as opposed to something like a snowball survey where you put it on Facebook or a poll on Twitter, you know, those are not social science. Right. Um, it's pretty expensive. And we hired a firm that does this all the time and has done it not only for academics, but also in market research, which is kind of interesting. And so it cost uh, almost $20,000 to do that. And I raised the money for it on Kickstarter. So if there are any people in you. your listening audience who helped with that in 2016 and made a donation to support this research, please know how much I appreciate that. And I hope that the research has proven interesting to them. <laughs> That's awesome. I didn't even know <laughs> that there was a Kickstarter. That's super interesting. And I'm, I'm glad that it got funded because the, the book is, is very intriguing. Uh, I think we'll talk a little bit about, um, I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, some of the findings that were surprising to you. And towards the end, just for the listeners' sake, um, so you know wh which way, which direction we're going, we will talk uh, a lot about... Uh, marriage and and mixed faith marriage yeah and, and, how, and how it relates how some of the research um shed a light on on marital issues as well uh but yeah talk to us as you went into it about some of the things that that surfaced that either were super interesting to you personally um as the research studies came back Right. So a couple of things that are kind of big picture findings. One is that we, uh, we did ascertain that more millennials are leaving the church. And actually that comes from general social survey data and from Pew because our survey was conducted one time in the fall of 2016. It's not longitudinal. You know, we're not following people over time to kind of see right. what they do. And you, you really need that if you're going to ascertain how does something today differ from what it looked like 30 years ago, for example. And what we can tell you from the GSS is that Mormons used to retain about three quarters of people who were Mormon when they were teenagers. Um, the GSS asks, what religion were you when you were 16? And then it asks, what religion are you now? And so it used to be a pretty consistently about three quarters. And then with Gen Xers, it starts to decrease to um, the low 60s. And then for millennials, it's actually uh, only 46%. Now that's a pretty high margin of error because so far in the aggregated GSS data from year to year, there aren't that many millennials yet. So that number could change, but it's clear that the trajectory is downward. So that's the first finding. Um, the second thing that I would say is that I really wanted to know quite a lot about beliefs and behaviors among, and comparatively among four generations of Latter-day Saints. And uh, we saw a pretty strong belief. I mean, millennials are not as dogmatic. They're not as certain about some of their beliefs, but they're strong believers still in, particularly in Christian doctrines, such as Jesus Christ being resurrected, Christ being the savior, God is real, the afterlife is real. All of those are very, very high compared to other millennials um, who are not Mormon. Mm -hmm. and that behavior was a little bit less strong. So that was kind of interesting to see that things like word of wisdom, adherence, and church attendance were not as high as we would have expected to see if they were patterned in the same way behavior-wise as older Mormons had those kind of in lockstep. So for older Mormons, people who had very high orthodoxy also had high orthopraxy. You know, what they're doing is very much in line with what they believe. And for millennials and also for Gen Xers, there's more of a divide. Even, um, you know, there's, there's overlap even among the categories of temple recommend holding 
millennials and Gen Xers who also might drink coffee or who also might not attend church very regularly. So that was interesting compared to older Latter-day Saints. So I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking, can you actually define millennial? Like what years do you, or does the, for the purposes of this study, uh, what's included in a millennial? Great question. So we're looking at people who are born from the very early 1980s up until either 1996 or 1998. Pew has now kind of um, stopped at 1996 and they're regarding anyone born after that as Generation Z. We stopped our survey in 1998 and there was kind of a practical purpose for that because you can be, you can take surveys without your parents' permission when you turn 18 and right. those people were 18 in 2016 when we did the survey. So it kind of came out very neatly, but it's still very, it's close enough to the generational divisions that Pew and, and other surveys have used that it's comparable data. Sure. Oh, well, I, I have a little smile on my face because we're, both millennials. we're millennials, Katie, we did it. <laughs> We did it. How old are you? Can I ask? It, oh, I was course. born in 81 and Alan was born in 82. So 37 so and 38. Barely just made that. <laughs> For some, you you would be still considered to be Gen X. I mean, on either end of the 1980s and the 1990s, it's a little bit squishy. But we will claim you as millennials. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. For this podcast, for sure. So on the older end, and I think that what I'm about to say fits into where we sit on that age spectrum, because when I read, uh, when I read the book, uh, the, the word of wisdom popped out at me. Oh my gosh. That was the practice because. Yeah. That was the most mind blowing part (laughs) for me. And I I know that a lot of people mentioned this online, uh, that they were so surprised at the the number of millennials, the percentage of millennials that believe yet just say, eh, I drink anyway. I drink coffee anyway, specifically. Or I drink alcohol. So w- did you distinguish between alcohol and coffee right. in your study? We did. You know, we had in the word of wisdom question, a whole series of possible substances, uh, everything from caffeinated coffee, decaffeinated coffee, alcohol, um, caffeinated tea, herbal tea, hallucinogenic drugs. I'm just trying to do this all from memory. Marijuana, um, cocaine. Yes. Those were very low, by the way. Right, right, right. Generations. Um, hard drugs were very, very low among Latter-day Saints um, compared to the general population. Alcohol was lower compared to the general population and coffee was lower compared to the general population, but it was surprisingly high for Latter-day Saints. So basically right. four in 10 Gen Xers and millennials said that they had had coffee, caffeinated coffee sometime in the last six months. And that's so interesting because my own personal experience is I stopped believing and I still didn't try coffee for 12 to 18 months. Mm. Or alcohol. And alcohol even longer. I I think that that has something to do with who you're married to, though. (laughs) Yeah, the the mixed faith part of it could could come in there. That's, That's a good point. Yeah. But that is because it's something that has to be negotiated in every family when someone has a faith transition or a faith exodus. Right. Now, can you talk to us a little bit about like, I'm, I'm trying to think back into my, my believer days. Uh, and I'm thinking, like, I'm thinking about some of the messages that are delivered at general conference or, or even at the pulpit and an award level. And, and I see, I see like if, if I were, if I were a leader in the church and I saw this study, I think a natural reaction would be, we've got to teach these millennials, stop it. Stop drinking coffee. Okay, but that's why they brought out, I mean, the new word of wisdom with in the new era. So, Jen, I guess the question is, <laughs> what do you see as what the church is is currently doing? Are they softening or are they, I don't want to use any aggressive terms, but are they are they kind of driving home the the current beliefs and saying, no, you've got to get on board? Good question. You know, when that came out this summer in the new era, some people asked me, is the church responding to your research? And I really don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. So let me just explain. The church has its own very strong, robust, well-populated research information division in church headquarters, which is staffed with full-time social scientists who study the church. Right. They already know this stuff. You know, they already know and are feeding information to church authorities about where, where potential 
adherence issues may crop up. So it, this is not because of our research. Well, the only thing I think that's different about our research is that it's public. You it's know, public, yeah. right? right. <laughs> it's available yeah, for everybody. For us peons, we we mm. we can <laughs> kind of understand what what where things are because of this research. So, right. But I think that the church uh, does not really move very quickly, usually on policy changes like that. And probably that decision has been in the works for a long time. It was interesting, though, to see that some of the things that had come up in our research and particularly in my oral history interviews, um, I'm thinking about iced coffee, which came up in a number of oral history interviews, and then green tea um, as issues that some younger people did not think were in violation of the word of wisdom. And in turn was, were mentioned in the New Era article, Green right. Tea specifically. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So what about the causes? And I think, I think a number of millennials are listening in here. I, I think I mentioned it to, to you in our kind of prep, <laughs> not even a prep email, our prep Facebook chat. <laughs> right that uh, our listener base is primarily millennials, millennials yeah. uh, and, and older. There are some Gen Zers, I'm sure, but uh, a lot of, uh, some of our listeners may have millennials as children as well. So mm -hmm. what, what are the causes of the millennials' loss of faith when, when faith is lost? Well, that's a different question. So uh, we're, not, we're not talking about behavior anymore. Just to clarify, we're going to talk about loss of faith. Right. Okay, so we did ask former Mormons. We, in, in our study, we had um, 1,156 respondents who identified as still involved with the church, still identified as Latter-day Saint. And we had 540 who had left, who had been Mormon in the past and had left the church. So the 540, we asked them why they left and provided a list of 30 possible reasons for leaving. And, you know, with any social science instrument, this is imprecise. So, right. of course, we would love to go back and ask different questions or follow up questions and all of that. But I can, you know, kind of sketch in broad strokes what they said about their reasons for leaving. And generationally, there were some interesting differences. You know, overall, the top reasons for leaving were pretty classic. I mean, you mentioned loss of faith, and that's basically right up there. Overall, the number one reason was I know I could no longer reconcile my personal values and priorities with those of the church. Number two was I stopped believing there was one true church. Number three, I did not trust the church leadership to tell the truth surrounding controversial or historical issues. So, you know, in the wider sample of former Mormons, those three things are pretty classic reasons for leaving religion. But when you look at just millennials or just women, for example, some other interesting things emerge in the top five or even the top three. And for millennials, the thing that tied for number one was I felt judged or misunderstood that tied with not trusting the church leadership. And then in third for millennials was LGBT issues. Mm -hmm. That was fascinating. You know, that that was an issue that doesn't rank in the top 10 at all for baby boomers and silent generation members who have left the church. But for millennials, it was third. So it has become something that is very signature in importance for their generation. Your generation, I should say. Right, right, right. right, right. Thank you for including us in that young do, generation. Yeah. Do you feel, and did you say that women, uh, was that women versus men or was that... No. Yeah. So that's an interesting thing, too. Two things about women as compared to men. Um, the number one reason for women who had left the church was I felt judged or misunderstood. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. It was not even in the top five for men. Mm -hmm. And the number three reason for women was the role of women. So mm -hmm. I try to make the point in the book that in the current Latter-day Saint sample, people who are still in the church and still identify that way, um, women's issues were, you know, there were generational differences. Certainly younger Latter-day Saints are more concerned about women not having the priesthood, for example, not being very visible. But, uh, but overall, women who are still in the church that kind of made their peace with it, 
And yet there is this other part of the story, which is that for women who left the church, this issue of women's roles was apparently pretty important for quite a few of them. That's fascinating. I can completely see and, and uh, I don't know, I feel like because we're millennials, maybe we talk about it more. And uh, mm-hmm. especially in the, the space where Alan and I are in, where we are constantly talking to people in a faith transition or who have had a faith transition. And this really resonates with me. I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, in the book, you talk about, I think you named it, I think his name was James. I don't know. Um, but I, I assume that that's just a uh, fake name. Uh, but it's, Some he. Some of them were fake, but most of them were actually real. I don't remember specifically about James. So this one, uh, he had had a faith transition, but yeah. was still attending because he still honored his wife's wishes to remain and take the kids to church. I think he worked for BYU and then his contract ended and that's kind of when he uh, made his exit. Is that, am I right? Yes. And um, yeah, I remember his story. I just don't remember if James was his real name. Yeah. Look at my notes about that. Yeah. um, So yeah, I would love to switch gears a little bit into talking about mixed faith marriages and I know that the study wasn't done about mixed faith marriages, but as you're interviewing people and collecting data, is there any general or overall theme between people who had left and transitioned and then their spouses who had stayed in? Mm. You know, that would be a very important thing to parse in the data. Ben and I are working on a follow-up book, uh, which is going to look at the former Mormons specifically. So I'm conducting a whole new round of interviews Uh, this time with people from all generations, because it's actually very interesting to hear the stories of people who left a long time ago as compared to now when a whole infrastructure exists for them to talk to uh, other people about their experiences or go online or listen to a podcast. You know, none of that existed 40 years ago. Right. Um, So in the context of working on that book, we are parsing the data again in different ways than we did the first time. And that, that can be certainly something we do. I do have a few things that I printed out in advance of this conversation to give you kind of a general. Yes, yes, um, we do. Yeah. So people who are still identifying as better teens, we ask them, how would you describe your spouse's level of activity in the LDS church? 63% said that their spouse was very active in the LDS church. Now, remember, this is these are the respondents who are also still in the church. And 24% said their spouse somewhat active. And then we had 7% said not too active. Another 6% say not at all active. So among current Latter-day Saints, the takeaway is that most of them are still married to current Latter-day Saints, Mm -hmm. uh, which is not, you know, that's like 0% surprising, right? Right. Um, Because it's a snapshot in time, we can't really tell from this how things are changing over time. We can, though, look at generationally the same data and see how that compares right now. And the generation most likely to to have a very active spouse in the LDS church is kind of split between millennials and the oldest response. Hmm. Silent. And Gen Xers have, kind of, and, and the older millennials too, have kind of fallen down. So there seems to be a bit of a crisis point there where people who are between 27 and 51 at the time of the survey are a little less likely to have a very active spouse. And I found this fascinating because from social science research, we know actually that the most religious time in most people's lives is when they have children at home. So people, and it's not just that they're sort of doing the things that they're going to church and that they're praying or having scripture study, but they also have higher levels of belief orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know if it's having teenagers or what, but you know, people feel (laughs) closer. Yeah, people feel closer to God when they're raising their children and their children are still at home. So that particular finding about spouse's level of activity kind of flies in the face of what I would have expected to see from that particular demographic. 
Yeah. yeah. I'll be inter- I'd be interested to see how that changes over time. We are the 6%, Katie. We're the 6%. We're the 6% <laughs> right now. You should have t-shirts made up. We <laughs> are the 6%. We are the 6%. The reason why I think I'd, I'd like to see that over time is I'm, I'm, I'm thinking when we record our podcast, we often have the perspective of our listeners in the back of our minds. Mm. And I can, I can hear the, the spouse who, who still believes so many of them are just, they're hoping for, for any glimpse of hope Their spouse that, will come back. no, not their spouse will come back, but what? that this can work. Oh, a lot yeah. of our, our listeners are are actually okay with one spouse being gone and them being in. I think a lot of the stress comes from the spouse that is still in thinking, I don't want to have to leave for this to work. I don't want to feel judged. I don't want mm-hmm. to feel pushed out because my husband or my wife is now um, outside of the church. And so I I look at that stat of 6%, only 6% responded with, yeah, my spouse is not active. And I can Mm -hmm. hear that believing, that believing spouse kind of going, oh no, that's, it doesn't, that doesn't look like it's very possible. Well, and, but in contrast, Jana, didn't you say that the number one reason why women leave is because they feel judged? Yes. Isn't that interesting? And, and so, I, I mean, I, I can attest to it's difficult uh, because there is, I've said this before, but there, there, I don't feel like there's a place for me. You mm-hmm. know, my husband's out. I'm still kind of trying to stay in. And yeah, there is a lot of judgment on me and my children and how I'm teaching them or what they are not being taught by their father. I mean, it's, it's rough. It's hard and it has nothing to do with, with your beliefs. Right. Nothing. I think that that's, Mm -hmm. that's a big change. I'm not sure if your, your study looks at this at all, but that's a big change in my, in my own brain over the last year and a half was at the very beginning, it was, I've learned all this new information. My, my departure was largely church history based and it was, I've got to not get Katie out, but I have to share this with her. Mm -hmm. And we, we heard that from a number of people, including the state president and John DeLynn was one of them, is that on average, the spouse follows them out. And I just assumed early in the journey that it was because eventually they'll learn the same stuff and then they'll leave. But now we're finding that heartbreakingly, the spouse that is still in still believes and they just, they start to feel judged. They start to feel like th- there's not really a place for me. And that's... That's, wow. I think it's tragic. It is tragic. You know, here's, a, here's something that I'm working on for the next book that uh, I think is an important clarification. Uh, former Mormons generally, so the 540 people we're looking at, also people in Pew database who have left Mormonism, they're still actually quite religious. And that's something that doesn't come through necessarily in internet communities of people who've left Mormonism as an experiment. And in order to find interviewees, not for the database, but just for people to do oral histories, um, I constructed a Google form in August and had, I I was looking to get 70 to 80 respondents and I wound up getting 1,499 applicants to be interviewed. I applied. Jenna, I, I, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm actually still going through them because I, th- I had written, you know, you'll hear by the end of September if you've been chosen to be part right. of it. But I'm actually yeah. I'm so inundated with applications. I'm not even finished going through them all yet. <laughs> anyway, um, what was interesting, though, was what I learned about how different that community is from the larger sample of former Mormons. You know, the Internet Mormons are very well educated they're uh, former Mormons, I should say, um, you know, very much more likely to have gone to college in our data and also Pew data nationally, former Mormons, it was more like one in five, one in four had a college degree. And for the internet, social media, former Mormons, it was seven in 10. That's like a 50 point differential. Wow. That's right. So the reasons that those people left are not necessarily the same reasons as people in the for, the whole former Mormon community writ large. Right. And I find that I'm always having to qualify that. So when you talk about 
what you learned about people who leave the church and then their spouse eventually follows, uh, we need to be careful to make sure that that's something that's true of former Mormons as a whole, or if that's something that's true of people who are involved in former Mormon communities online, because that is its own social world and it has normative features, yes, uh, that, that are really important for us to consider when we're talking about research. Yeah, those are great points. Yeah. Really good points. That. Thank you. We have a few questions that, uh, from, from a, a couple of people in our Facebook group, coincidentally. <laughs> we have yeah. our email group. And uh, some of them you've, you've already answered, but you, know, you mentioned a couple of things that one of our, our listeners asked is um, the church is big, right? It, it, it tends to move slower, whether that's deliberately or just the fact that it's large. It's hard to move a large, um, large object or large uh, church. So do you, do you feel, and I don't know if the study shows this or if just your personal feeling, I love hearing your personal thoughts too. Mm. Do you feel like the church is, is changing fast enough to keep the, the younger generation? Gosh, good question. Um, complicated answer. Yeah. Being, you know, my response, focuses only on the states. The leaders of the church thinking about the whole world. They are responsible for Latter-day Saints. They're responsible for Latter-day Saints in the Philippines. And the cultural issues are not always the same. So, you know, my risk of myopia is that I'm going to look at everything that the church does through the lens of the United States. So that's something I need to be really careful about. Sure. Okay, so that's my caveat before I talk about this question. Is it changing enough to accommodate people, young people in the church today who maybe are on the brink of leaving? In this country, I would say probably not, but many of them were going to leave anyway, Mm. no matter what the church does. And that is uh, just kind of part and parcel with disaffiliation in general, not just Latter-day Saints, but sort of the documented process of deconversion that once it begins, it is it's pretty hard to go back in that box. You, you can't quite open you know, Pandora's box and then put all the contents back the same way they were before, shut the box, put a bow on it, and pretend that everything is great. And so you know, people like Katie, you've talked about having a, a more nuanced faith, being still in the church. That is fantastic. And when people are able to do that, that's great. But a lot of people who are more black and white thinkers continue the black and white thinking, but just on the other side. So they've gone from being all in and seeing the world in one particular way to believing it's all completely wrong and they're seeing the world in the opposite way, but it's still not very <laughs> nuanced. I'm not saying that about, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, about Alan, absolutely not. Sure. Just that is some people's experience. And for those people, there's really nothing anybody can do because unless they're Uh, perspective becomes more open to the fact that people have different kinds of truth, that things are relative, then there's nothing that can be done. The other thing that is really, really important for us to consider here is that Mormonism is not an island. And what is going on in this country, I was trying to explain it to someone, and maybe I'll write a column about We're looking at the 90th anniversary this month of the fall of the stock market, the crash of the of wall street that precipitated the great depression depression i feel like religiously we are right there Uh, we are essentially living through the equivalent of a religious stock market crash and if you think about that in a financial term you can prepare all you want to you know you, you can have do all the right things and you know save and invest your money and all of these things that you're supposed to do you still can't help it if you just happen to be the bad luck person who is maybe about to retire when the stock market crashes or whatever. My point is that when you're living through a crash, there's only so much that you can do. And that is true of a small religion, just as it is true of an individual investor. We are really um, at at the mercy of wider trends in our society. We are one and a half percent of the U.S. population. And you cannot help but be strongly affected by what is going on. And what is going on is that young people in particular are leaving religion in uh, unprecedented numbers. Yeah, so that was going to be my next question is how are Mormon millennials leaving compared to other religions? And do we have data for that? 
We do have data for that. It's, it's not uh, completely consistent. So I'll tell you what, what we do know, which is that many mainline Protestant churches had their dive in the 70s and in the 80s. And, you know, we're talking here about some United Methodists, Episcopalians, um, Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, ELCA Lutherans, which are actually not the Evangelical Lutherans, even though they have Evangelical in their name. And I'm sorry, <laughs> that, that's confusing. But mainline Protestants kind of had a lot of pain in this period. And in social science, what developed was the strict churches theory, which basically said, well, they're losing members because they have liberalized and because they have made things too open. They don't have standards anymore. People want standards. People want to be told what to do. Conservative churches will continue to thrive if they have um, impermeable boundaries with society. And that became a very popular thesis, including among many Mormons, because who doesn't want to be told that you're doing everything right and that you are, uh, you know, you, you are holding the line and you are succeeding because you're holding the line. Mm -hmm. Problem with that theory now is that it no longer holds true because the same strict churches that are, you know, were lauded in the 1980s in particular as being this wonderful bastion of, of the strict churches, the strict religion theory, um, they're failing too. And Mormons are struggling. Evangelical Christians are struggling. The Southern Baptists have lost 1 million members in the last decade. Uh, a lot of different religious movements are bleeding. There are some exceptions and, and it's not completely across the board, which is why I said it's not a perfectly consistent picture. Mm -hmm. But that's what's going on in the wider culture. And the strict churches theory doesn't really accommodate that. So we, we have to find a new reason why this is happening. Right. So the millennials that are deciding to, to stay in the church, are they forging their own Mormonism? You know, so we talked a little bit about uh, the word of wisdom, but do you see them changing things up in other areas? Maybe, you know, missions or temple recommends or, yeah. Do you see any trends in that, in those areas? I definitely do. And how those changes at the local level may or may not be trickling up to church headquarters is beyond my pay grade. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I can certainly attest to some of the things that are going on at the ward and stake level and also in missionary work, as you pointed out, mm -hmm. which is that the, the old models are not necessarily working anymore. And some millennials who are committed to staying in the church are questioning, why do we do it this way? And what is the point of this particular program? Or what is the point of everyone having to wear a white shirt? What is up with that? what is essential to the gospel and what is simply cultural uh, leftovers from a previous yeah. era. Mm -hmm. um, there's been, yeah, I'll just leave it there. And, and I think that's exciting to see that younger people, particularly some who are now in leadership, you know, who are now bishops, who are serving on state councils, who are relief society presidents and state council, their state relief society presidents, they're making changes and it, it helps. I think it's funny that you mentioned like the white shirt thing, because early on after Alan's was going through his transition, he decided, I think he almost has had PTSD of wearing a, a white shirt and tie. So he started wearing colored shirts to, to church. And that was everyone's tip off that something was going on <laughs> was that he was wearing yeah. colored shirts to heaven forbid. Heaven forbid. It just was changed, crazy. I hadn't changed anything else. I was still there. And, uh, and and someone said to me, um, "How's Alan doing?" And I said, no, "You asked them." How, oh, I said, "Oh yeah." Think, I said, "What do you? How do you, how do you think, think Alan's doing? Alan's doing?" And they said, "Well, I saw him with a colored shirt on." And well, I saw him with <laughs> colored shirts. And I Katie, just couldn't oh, believe it. Katie made the blunder of telling me about it, and I went, "Are you serious?" Yeah. I am trying to make this work. And <laughs> right, right. But it, it, it's, it's just so funny what people are so fixated on um, culturally yeah. in the church. And, and I think that that just drives a lot of people away or maybe not away, but just they're, you know, they get kind of get turned off by, by something like that. And my 13 year old, let me tell you, he doesn't just take no for an answer. And he doesn't just, I can't just say to him, 
well, I, it's because I said so it's, um, mm-hmm. it's, it's just, it's a different, and I just, I see it in my kids coming up too. So. I'm glad you brought that up. The authority issue. There's a chapter in the book about millennials and authority and some of the findings that we had about how millennials who are still in the church feel about general authorities, how they feel about general conference. And, you know, compared to other millennials, they're pretty authority minded, but compared to older Latter-day Saints, they are just, you know, very different. And it's a pretty interesting trajectory. It's a pretty interesting generational shift. I wanted to to make a mention, you talked about the, the colored shirt being the tip off. Only last year after I, you know, I converted to the church when I was 23. So this was 26 years ago, right? Only last year did I find out that I'm not supposed to take the sacrament with my left hand. I couldn't believe it. You know, that this, this had been a, an unwritten rule all along that mm-hmm. people are supposed to take the sacrament with their right hand. I hardly do anything with my right hand. I guess I use my mouse with my right hand, you know, that, that's <laughs> right. I my computer. but I, I just couldn't believe it. And we are so used to being instructed that our outward behavior is a sign of our inward worthiness and righteousness. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, something like that. Apparently all this time I've been taking the sacrament the wrong, unworthy, horrible way. And I had no idea. So I hear that, that in the millennial in me, I'll say, wants to say, who cares? Like, does God really care if we take the sacrament with our left hand or our right hand? And, and I'm just, I, right. Yeah. But who speaks for God? Yeah. Yeah. I know. I and know. So I'm when just... right-handed people, apparently. Right. <laughs> Jana, I'm, I'm a fellow left-hander by the way. Are you? Yay. Yeah, I am. Um, so yeah, I mean, when last year, when president Oaks made that statement of he's with a, a deacon's quorum and the one thing he can leave with them, the only time they'll be with a first presidency member their whole lives probably is that is you need to pass with your right hand. And it's, it's like, wait a minute, hold on. But then you, on my side, I, I, I get it why people would, would hold to that. Mm-hmm. I have to do it the right way because they had this, this leader who they accept as speaks, speaking for God, telling them this is how it needs to be done. Right. That actually leads me to a question on, and this is an impossible question to answer. So I apologize ahead of time. You already mentioned it's above your pay grade, but I look at, um, does the church want big tent or little tent? Do they want people there or do they not? When, when I look at, I mean, the answer is obviously they want people there. But when I look at some of the, some of the policies, some of the decisions that are being made, uh, we've talked about a lot of them here. I, I, I'm concerned that the path the church is going at this moment is only going to leave the most conservative members left and further alienate those on the fringes or those that are more nuanced and until they just say, I'm, I'm done. And then your, those that are being called even at the local level are by area authorities are state presidents that hold a more conservative literal view. And it's, it's like the, the progress that so many people, at least on, uh, on the, on my end or the nuanced side, are hoping for maybe is, is not as close as we would hope. Mm. Any thoughts on that? I know oh, it's, I it's a lot it's, of thoughts. I'm not sure it's fully loaded <laughs> together in a, in a coherent way, but I'll try. Um, you know, I agree with you that the church tends to promote to leadership people who are well, they you know, they're very well corporate they are uh, socialized in a particular way successfully and they're they have high belief orthodoxy but they also have a particular way of dealing with authority and so i hear you on that score that it's there's a disconnect between what many leaders who have been promoted particularly i think at the the stake and area authority level are like and then maybe there's the disconnect with how they respond to people who are in a faith crisis or having right. a more nuanced faith. Uh, it, and you mentioned David Osler, you know, that's exactly what his research is showing, which is fascinating. Like when he's interviewing, not just people who are having a faith crisis, but also bishops and current Relief Society presidents, current leaders, 
they really have no idea. You know, they think that the church in general is probably handling faith crisis okay, but when asked personally, how are you dealing with it and do you feel equipped to handle it? They don't at all. And that should tell us a lot right there. Yeah. I'm being very Pollyannish, but I do have great hope for the new youth program. And the hope lies in the fact that it is adaptable, that it's flexible, that people can change it at the local level in a way that hasn't been possible with correlation in the last uh, 50 plus years. Um, I think that's potentially very fruitful. And it, hopefully we will see a thousand flowers bloom. And hopefully we will be able to have some of these young people, Generation Z is what I'm thinking of now, uh, experience church in fresh ways that just have not been possible for millennials. I think millennials and Generation Z, who grew up entirely correlated and who grew up with a, a highly programmatic kind of Mormonism, without the, the wonderful local variation that used to exist in the church when we still had road shows and we still had primary during the week and that sort of thing, and then what may come with the, the youth program, I think you will find for you who did grow up in the church that you had the most impoverished Mormon childhood of just about any generation in our history. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, yeah. Katie and I, I'll be on the older end of the, of the millennial spectrum. We did get, I got some road shows. Oh, you did? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we did some road shows. Yeah, a woman in our ward would re rewrite Disney musicals with lyrics to to tell a story about the church, and that was really fun to be involved with when I was younger. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Now, I have no uh, elegant or graceful way to shift the topic more to marriage specific. We've talked a little bit about uh, marriage in in specifics, but let's shift the topic towards that and still focusing on the study and research that that was done what else and this is a very open broad question but what else did the study tell us about about marriage within uh, millennials or the lds church sure first of all let's just talk about marital status among latter-day saints and how that has changed over time we have a little bit of longitudinal data on this from pew and uh, a couple other things so we can tell you a few things. First of all, Mormons are a very married people. And compared to other religious groups, we have one of the highest rates of current marriage of any religious group. We, we are second only to Hindus in the highest rate of endogamous marriages, meaning people who marry other Mormons. So kind of what we were talking about before. But some of the things that are changing, we have a, a growing demographic of singles in the church, people who have never married. And that increased from 12% to 18% between the Pew study and our study. And, you know, that's not, uh, that doesn't sound like much. But when you think about the difference between 12% and 18%, that, is, that represents a 50% growth in that demographic. So it is important for us to look at. We, um, we also see a small, like I would say a modest increase in Latter-day Saints who are cohabiting. So people who are living with a romantic partner without being married, still very small single digit group, but it was higher among millennials than I would have expected to see. That was interesting. That is interesting. Okay, is there so any different... sort of trajectory? Like, I mean, do you do a trajectory for like 10, 20 years into the future? Well, <laughs> yeah. How, how do you, yeah. I, mean, I mean, I've been doing that. <laughs> with very mixed results. I think that the, the graveyard of social science is littered with the bodies of failed theories. <laughs> right. So we need to be careful. But one thing that does come through pretty clearly, not just in our study, but in several others as well, is that um, people who are married are generally more religiously involved and more religiously orthodox than people who are not married. Mm. Mormons were no different. So Mormons are very much in line with other religious groups on that particular question. And so the growth of singles in the church, you can kind of hear in, in between the lines of general conference when they pound that drum about uh, just get married already, essentially, which helped no single person ever, I think, in the history of the world to just be told, go get married already. Get married. Like, oh, I never thought of that. Great idea. Thanks, you know. Um, but 
they're concerned about it. And the concern is legitimate because they know that their bread and butter in terms of the most orthodox members who tithe, who raise their kids, or who have kids, you know, who raise their kids Mormon, is that married demographic. So it, it's not just a theological question of how can we contribute to eternal families. It's also a very real logistical and organizational question, which is how do we perpetuate our institution in the healthiest way? Interesting. Now, I'm not saying that that I agree with that. I hope yeah. that's clear. But right. that is, I think, how they view it. That's how they view it. Yeah. yeah. It, it uh, makes sense to me. I mean, you can, I mean, you look at, uh, I mean, I look at and call it cynicism, but I, I look at the, I mean, the church, like you said, Jana, the, the church knows uh, a lot of this data just from their own and may probably more from their that's own right. studies. Yeah. Right. And uh, it gives new meaning thinking about it in these terms to the missionary age being dropped. And, you know, let's yeah. plug that gap of kids that leave when they graduate high school and get them on missions real quick. And then when they're on the mission, it's the message is the very next step is get married right when you get home. Our, our mission president set me up with Katie. <laughs> she was a missionary in the same mission. And that's how we met. And Where did you serve? Barcelona, Spain. Wow, that's that's adorable. Can I just oh, say? Oh. No, and and I I'm glad that we both still feel that way because I still look at it very fondly, and it's a fun story to tell that the last day of my mission, the mission president encouraged <laughs> me to ask her out. <laughs> wow, President Watson, if you're out there, love you, bud. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for that. Thanks Thank for that. you. <laughs> yeah, and so I, I mean, it it absolutely makes sense, but it it also is. Um, seeing that 50% increase in, in singles, uh, is, is hard. We've talked with some singles. I know this is a mixed faith marriage podcast and, but we've talked to some singles and how difficult it can be, uh, mm -hmm. to be in the church because of that marriage drum that is being, being beaten. And I don't, I'm expositioning a little bit, or I don't know if that's the word for it, but yeah. So it's, I, I don't think that the, the marriage drum is beaten solely to keep people in. Mm -hmm. It's a core fundamental doctrine and a very beautiful one. With, Multiply and replenish the, the earth. Multiply and replenish. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, it's very central to the plan of happiness. Exactly. No, that's right. And I, I don't want to undersell the, the important theological component this is, of but course. it's also, there's this organizational component too. Any, any other insights that the research or your personal thoughts <laughs> would lend yeah. to a, a mixed faith uh, environment. Well, I'm intrigued that an entire podcast about this exists because I've been in an interfaith marriage for 28 years, happily. Mm -hmm. um, my husband, when we got married, I was Presbyterian and I was studying to be a pastor. I was in seminary and he was a Methodist and he was uh, at that point working and then later went back to school. And I became a Mormon after we'd been married for about a year and a half. Wow. Which was, yeah, it was, it was just not the plan. He and I were talking about this just the other day. You know, the plan was that he was going to be a pastor's husband. He already played the piano. That was the joke. You know, the pastor's wife <laughs> oh, that's great. has always been required to play the piano, but he, he had that skill, you know, he had that whole skill set ready to go. And then I changed the game and said, actually, not only do I, not think I'm supposed to be a pastor, but I think I'm supposed to become a Mormon. And there was this kind of mic drop moment, like, what? <laughs> wow. Right. So I, I guess this is just by way of for people in your, in your listening group, that it is possible to build a successful marriage after a faith transition for one of the partners. And my husband, you know, he has also had a more minor, I would say, faith transition. He's Episcopalian now. And partly that was because a number of years ago, this is almost 15 years ago now, the, the Methodist church that he had been attending had a class on, on cults in America. And guess which uh, cult was front and center? It was oh, the Mormons. The Mormons. Oh. Yeah. He was pretty offended by that, as was I. So he is Episcopalian and I am a Latter-day Saint. We will go to each other's church services. We will be as supportive as we possibly can of each other. And in fact, I went to Turkey with a pilgrimage group from his uh, Episcopal church 
on a, you know, this fantastic religious pilgrimage to historical sites in Turkey. He didn't want to go because he's very introverted. You know, he's like, I don't think I want to be on a bus with a bunch of people right. for 11 days. I guess what I'm just trying to say is that put the relationship first above everything else. It is the most important. That's the core. Your story is just so fascinating to me. And so you certainly do uh, understand the ins and outs of an interfaith or, you know, what we call a mixed faith marriage. It's, it, can be, it can be hard to navigate. And it's how neat is it with your background that you have so much experience in this? <laughs> Well, I wish that there had been more of a supportive community in the 1990s when I joined the church. You know, yeah. at that time, we, <laughs> believe it or not, the internet did not really exist. Right. Um, it's hard to imagine that now, but essentially, and I was in a great ward. I was in the Princeton, New Jersey ward, which was mm-hmm. just about as progressive as you could possibly dream of. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was not the only one, but it was still a pretty isolating experience sometimes to not have a spouse in the church. And some of the very clueless comments that were made through the years. Um, yeah. And all of the things that you have to negotiate, you know, will you have the missionaries over for dinner? Uh, right. We don't really do that very much anymore because it's just too fraught. Right. My next question is when are you going to do your study for mixed faith marriages? <laughs> Because selfish, yeah. selfishly, that's really what I want to know is I want to know data just surrounding it. And man, do we have a group that is a wealth of knowledge. So if you ever decide to do that or get to that point, we would love you to tap into our resources and connections with people because we, we certainly can help, help with that. Well, thank you so much. It's, there is a chap, or there will be, (laughs) it's all still in my brain, but when the book is written, yes, there will be a chapter on how leave taking affects the family relationships, uh, uh, crucially marriage, but also relationship with parents, siblings, and one's own children. If, you know, a person has children and some of those stories so far in the oral history interviews are pretty heartbreaking. Some of them are fine, you know, parents who are very accepting, spouses who just say, well, I love you no matter what. And then there are other stories as well that you probably have heard before. Um, People who maybe considered divorcing a spouse, for example, just because of this this faith issue. And, you know, I find that really sad, to be honest. And that's a little bit of my own editorializing based on my autobiography, which I've already shared, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that way. This is a really important note to probably end the podcast on the very fact that you are listening and you is the listener, not Janet. The very fact that you're listening means that you're trying, that you've already gotten to a point where you want this to work. And for most of you out there, both spouses are listening. So Jana, I think it would be very heartening is that the opposite of disheartening (laughs) it would be very it would be very heartening for most of our listeners to see those heartbreaking stories because they've already gotten past a lot of that critical moment will this work or not just based on the fact that they're listening to this podcast in general that's what we've seen we have seen divorce we have seen a few things here and there but for the most part people are really trying hard by the time they they find us Yes. Well, and I'm so glad that your community exists for them, especially in that really crucible, crucible crisis time. Right. The crucible of mixed faith. And that's, um, I'm hoping that you'll see that in your study as well, is that once both spouses make that wonderful decision to try to make it work, uh, the relationship really blossoms working through all of the hard things that come with mixed faith. And I'm sure that you could uh, attest to that in your own marriage as well. Yes. Absolutely wonderful blessings. Well, Jana, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. If any of you um, are listening and that you want more information, Jana, can you maybe give them a website to direct them to and where they can buy your book? Thank you for asking that. I always forget. The website is thenextmormons.org and the book is called The Next Mormons. It can be purchased 
at Amazon and all other places where fine books are sold. Isn't that what they say? <laughs> That's right. And what's the best way to contact you if you want to be contacted? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have a lot of time for uh, as much as I would like for reader interaction. Twitter's probably a good way, actually, if you have, have a particular question about the research, just shoot me a tweet and I'll try to answer it. Chances are pretty good that other people have the same question. If, however, your question is about millennials and garments and sex, which if you've read the book, you'll know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Just don't even because that question seems to come up about every other week. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. Yes. Words Words the note, I guess. Yes. Perfect. Well, Jenna, thank you so much again for coming on. We appreciate your time and your expertise and uh, just so I've learned a lot. And so we just so much appreciate it. And we hope to have you on in the future for all of your future endeavors and books. When the next book comes out. That's right. This has been fun. Thank you very much. Jenna.